Hey guys, what's up? So if I've sent you this video, there's a very good chance that you're either getting ready to make an offer or it's time to make an offer. Um, so this video will serve as basically an overview of the basics of making an offer. Now I fully assume that you'll still have questions after this and that's totally fine, but I wanna get through some of the basics of putting in an offer and hopefully you find this video helpful in that regard. Okay, so the first thing that I wanna talk about is pricing strategy. How do we decide on a price in terms of making an offer for the house that you're looking at. So there's a couple things that go into this and I always preach this to my clients is that my method for putting an offer in on a home, which has been very successful over the last two years of this crazy market, is to do my homework. So that will be part of this pricing strategy. So the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna run comps on the house that you're looking at. Comps is a term meaning comparatives and we're gonna take all of the properties that are similar to the one that you're looking at, and we're gonna make sure that we understand the pricing. And that means homes that are like yours that are actively listed, that have recently gone under contract, and that have recently sold. And when we say recently sold, we keep it to within a year, and if we can, if we have enough options, we'll keep it to within six months. So that's what we'll look at as far as comps. Once I run those numbers, I'm gonna come up with a price that I think I would have put it on the market for, and once we have that price, the next thing I do is I put in a call to the listing agent of the home. I find out how many offers they have, if there's anything that the sellers are looking for in terms of timeline or um, types of payment or anything like that, something that would give us a leg up. And based on those two factors, I'm gonna call you and I'm gonna say, all right, here's what I advise for price. Now, generally what I do is I'm gonna give you a bit of a range, and that range is going to be dictated by how much you want this house. In other words, sometimes people say, Craig, you know what? We love this house at 370, but that's about our limit on this particular house. And it ranges from people saying, Craig, we must have this house. We're gonna lose a ton of sleep if we don't get it. So what would you recommend? And obviously within that range that I give you, you can make a, a, a educated guess as to where you wanna lie in that price spectrum. So that's how we come up with our price for an offer. Okay, the next step is your pre-approval. So if you are using a mortgage to finance a home, the next thing that we need to do is we need to have a pre-approval to include in your offer. So hopefully you've already gotten a pre-approval. If not, um, we'll have to, we can talk about that separately in terms of what will be needed to get a pre-approval. But assuming at this point you and I have already talked about that and you have your pre-approval, we just want to make sure that we call the lender, I will call the lender for you, and say that we're gonna get a personalized pre-approval. That pre-approval is gonna be personalized to include the price that we're offering and the address of the house so that the agent that's getting the offer understands that we are putting this in with this pre-approval just for this house. The biggest reason for this is we don't wanna show all our cards. For example, if you're approved for a million dollars, but you're buying a $400,000 house, we don't need to necessarily let them know that you're approved for another $600,000. We just want them to know that you're fully qualified to purchase this particular house. So in terms of your pre-approval with this offer, that is the consideration that we do with the pre-approval at this point. Okay, the next consideration on your offer is the closing timeline. So this is um, many, many variables here. Number one is what is your need for closing? Do you need to close fast? Do you need to close slow? Or do you have a lot of flexibility? And then the other consideration is on the other side of the transaction is what are the seller's needs? And can we get a leg up by saying that, hey, we have a lot of flexibility and we can work with you? Or this deal will only work under these parameters. So we will talk about closing timeline and what options you have available to you in this market. This can be huge because if people are looking to buy a home when they sell their home, you can purchase their home and say, hey, look, if you need time to find a home, that's fine with us. We're uh, you know, living with our parents or we're renting month to month or anything like that where you have that flexibility can give you quite a leg up on your offer. So closing timeline will be important and we will come up with a plan together to determine the best course. Okay, the next consideration is your down payment structure. So what do I mean by this? So down payment can basically be broken down into really three things. Um, so let's say you're putting down, you're buying a $400,000 house and you're putting down 10% or $40,000. We're gonna determine how we're gonna split that up. The first consideration is your EMD or your earnest money deposit. This is the money that you're basically giving with your contract to say, hey, we're pretty serious and here's a show of our faith. I recommend at that price point of 400,000 that you do at least $5,000, but if you have the cash and it's liquid, 
you can put in much more to show them you're very serious and you have cash available to you. It's a good vote of confidence that, you know, if you're putting down a large payment, the people don't have to worry about that you're actually going to come up with that money. Because if they do have that concern, there could be further uh, requirements, like they could ask for a proof of funds or something like that. So bit, putting down a big early deposit is, is a very good way to show them confidence that you have that money on hand. Now, that money is going to be due generally at signing. So once we all sign the contract, buyers and sellers, that money is then due. And this money is, um, again, I'm not your legal representative, and you can confirm this with your attorney, but that number, that money is generally refundable if the deal doesn't go through. So if you go through attorney review and for whatever reason the deal doesn't go through or you get beat in a multi-offer situation, you don't, that deposit is not due. And if it falls apart during attorney review, then that deposit comes back to you. As long as everything has been done in good faith, there's very little risk there. Again, I am not your legal advisor, so you can confirm this with your attorney, but generally speaking, that is the case. The next consideration with your deposit is what we call secondary deposit. That secondary deposit is generally something that's about 10 days after we've given the first deposit. It's just another um, deposit that's given, again, just to confirm with them that we have our money, it's liquid, and we're gonna give it as the transaction goes through. And it's just less money that they need to hope that you can come to the closing table with. So again, let's say you're putting down 40,000. Let's say we put down 5,000 with the contract, your earnest money deposit. And then we told them we're gonna put down another 15 as a secondary deposit 10 days later. Now, they don't have to wait for you to come to the closing table with $40,000. They only have to wait for you to come with the remaining 20. So again, it just gives that offer a little bit of confidence. There's a little less stress on both sides to, to make sure that you can perform on that deposit. And it, it strengthens your offer by giving that secondary deposit. And last but not least is the rest of your down payment. That'll be due at closing. So whatever's left from what we just discussed, if you're putting down 10%, we gave 5,000 initial, we gave 15,000 as secondary, so what's left? $20,000, and that is due at the closing table. So this last deposit will be entered as your what's due at closing, and that is the rest of your deposit. So you can see how that deposit structure can potentially strengthen your offer by giving a little more confidence in providing money throughout as opposed to a large lump sum that's due at the end. Now, some people just have to do that that way, especially if you're selling a home to buy your next home. You might need to do a large deposit at the end, but we'll be sure to communicate that as part of your offer so that there is no uh, concern with the sellers that you're not going to be able to come up with that money at closing. Okay, choosing an attorney. So I obviously have a few attorneys that I work with regularly that I can recommend to you, but this would probably be the time that you have an attorney in mind. Now, if you don't have a real estate attorney, which most people don't have a real estate attorney on standby, um, please feel free to talk to me and I can tell you about the several that I've worked with that I recommend. If you wanna find your own attorney, you work perfectly, perfectly um, fine to do that on your own. It's just a matter of making sure um, that you hit some of the concerns that we have when people come in with their own attorney is make sure if you're using a relative or a friend, make sure that they are an active real estate attorney. A lot of times people have a, someone in the family or a friend that said, oh yeah, 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 I can do your, your real estate transaction for you, but they may not be very active in real estate. They might be doing some other form of law and just be careful with that. And also I just generally advise people, this is not where you wanna save money. So I would, I would avoid going for a bargain attorney because um, there are a lot of considerations. New Jersey is a um, attorney review state. So this is a big part of the transaction. Um, a lot of states don't even use attorneys and um, you want to just make sure that you have someone that's that's really good and is going to advocate for you. So that's choosing an attorney. All right, so the next subjects that I want to discuss are uh, two things, personal letters as well as escalation clauses. I get asked this question a lot. So these are two kind of polarizing subjects in real estate. Number one is the personal letters. There is a movement in real estate to eliminate this out of the process. Uh, the reason being is that there's potential liability here for sellers to read these letters and then choose an offer based on that. This basically revolves around family status. For example, just a very broad example, if you had a single mom submitting an offer versus a family, and the family ends up getting chosen by the seller for whatever the reason may be, that single mom could potentially have recourse to say, hey, you only didn't choose my offer because I'm a single mom and I don't have a 
family and you wanted to give your house to the family. That is a big liability concern for sellers. So a lot of people are choosing not to accept these. Now, as part of that call with the listing agent that I mentioned earlier, I'm always gonna ask the question, are you accepting personal letters? And if they are accepting personal letters, then I think you should submit one because you don't wanna be the only one not submitting a personal letter. So that is why that question is always asked. Similarly, this is the case with escalation clauses. Now, I'm not going to explain fully what escalation clauses are, but they are another polarizing subject in real estate. In fact, some agents and sellers downright despise them. So again, as part of that call to the listing agent, I'm going to ask if they are accepting escalation clauses. I personally do not like escalation clauses. Um, I actually ask on my listings that they are not submitted. However, once again, we want to make sure we're not the only ones not submitting an escalation clause because that could potentially cause, cost you the listing. So uh, we can talk a little bit more about what escalation clauses, but please be rest assured that I will do my homework and make sure um, that they are uh, not on the plate so that we don't miss out on anything. Okay, and the last question that I usually get is, Craig, when are we gonna find out if our offer was accepted? So generally speaking, in real estate, we try to stick to 24 hours as a courtesy to let anyone know that submitted an offer. The exception to this is something we see a lot in this market is if you see a highest and best situation. So in a lot of the popular listings now, you'll see something that indicates highest and best offer due, say, Wednesday at five o'clock. So, if that's the case, you know, we're not necessarily waiting until Wednesday to five, at five o'clock to submit our offer. We could have submitted our offer on Tuesday. The case in that, in that situation though, that the situation is that they won't review those offers until that deadline hits. Then we have to give them some, some time to review them and then probably looking at 24 hours. So we give a little extra time in that. Uh, so if you if we did submit your offer on that Tuesday, but offers are due end of day Wednesday, then we can expect a little more time to hear from them. But generally speaking, as a rule, the timeline is about 24 hours to hear if your offer has been accepted. Okay, so that's a very, very general overview of the offer process. If you have any further questions, which I fully expect, and no question is stupid, please feel free to reach out to me, text me, call me, whatever the case may be, and say, Craig, couple more questions for you and I hope this was helpful and if you wouldn't mind always I'm always asking to uh, like the video and subscribe to my channel there's a lot of uh, informative stuff and if you're working with me you'll probably get more of these videos that just give you the basics and hopefully are helpful to you feel free to share this with anyone that you know is uh, purchasing a home and uh, thanks for working with me always appreciate it take care